Good morning, church, as a famous friend of mine named Randolph Charles always said, uh, I am here uh, in St. James Church. Uh, it's Friday, it's springtime outside, and it's my joy to record uh, our fourth session on As We Pray, So We Believe, teasing out from the Book of Common Prayer our our various theologies. Last week we teased out the theology of sin as it is seen in certain aspects of prayer book liturgy and thought. And today's topic is what does it mean to be a baptized person? What is the Book of Common Prayer's theology of baptismal identity? So that's what I hope to, to open us up to this morning in this adult class. If you were to turn to page 928 in the Book of Common Prayer, you would see that there are suggested readings when there is a baptismal service. Uh, say perhaps a regional group of churches decided to have a baptismal service together or a, a baptisms as part of a regional confirmation. There are suggested readings for such an occasion. And they, uh, there are three readings from St. Paul's thinking that have been fundamental to my own personal understanding of holy baptism. Uh, these readings, as I hear them in my mind and in my heart, speak of what I call the three gifts that God gives us uh, as baptized persons. Uh, the first, one of the first readings, and it's a classic reading for understanding the theology of holy baptism, is from Romans chapter 6, where St. Paul says these words. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It was about three Easter's ago, Easter uh, on Holy Saturday, uh, one of my cousins got married. I did the wedding, and in, in the course of the wedding preparation, Pete realized, and I realized, and we all realized that Pete had never been baptized but he desired to be. So part of the Gulick clan gathered at Cedar Run on Holy Saturday afternoon about three years ago, and Pete was baptized uh, by immersion by me in Cedar Run, and he went all the way under the water, and we have a video to prove it. And uh, it was just so powerful and so wonderful and actually quite exciting. But for St. Paul, the first metaphor of baptism is being buried with Christ in his death, going into that watery grave where the God who raised Jesus from death grabs us in the watery grave of our baptism and raises us to new life. Um, so the first gift then, I would think, of what it means to be baptized is the gift of hope. We are buried with Christ in his death. In fact, the, the church believes that holy baptism is our essential death, our essential dying, and then any dying that occurs after that, including our physiological death, is just a moment in the eternal life that began at our baptism. And we trust, because we're baptized folks, that those same Easter arms that grabbed Jesus will grab us. So the first gift of our baptismal identity is the gift of hope. Paul goes on in that same letter to the Christians in Rome. He goes on to give us yet another understanding and another metaphor. In Romans 8 at verse 14, he says these incredible words, they really are incredible. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. 
For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Wow, what a statement. What an affirmation. And uh, that spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, that's the word in Aramaic for intimate dad, uh, intimate father. Paul's understanding is that in the Christ event, which is per personal for us in our baptism, we are adopted the way Romans could adopt an adult into the family and endow that adult with all the privileges of family and inheritance. So St. Paul believed that in our baptism, in our life in Christ, we are baptized into that same intimate love bond that existed between Abba, the Father, and the Son, which is huge. And I taught this, and I believe this, and when I was a young priest with my wonderful seminary education, I would do baptismal preparation. I would explain to the family with the baby that, but that I could tell them about this wonderful Aramaic word, Abba, and it meant a lot to me, and I enjoyed doing that preparation. But then I had a life experience that really galvanized my understanding of the power of this Abba concept. And that life experience occurred in the early 80s when Barbara and I decided that we would volunteer and sign up to be foster parents with um, Catholic Relief Services. And so what that meant was we decided to be newborn foster parents. So we would get a three-day or four-day-old baby right from the hospital, and we would care for that child for two to three months until the child could be uh, adopted through the Catholic Relief Catholic, excuse me, Catholic Family Services uh, adoption program. So we were, um, ho uh, we had welcomed our first little boy into our family. We had three children, and uh, so we had this little baby. And Barbara and I decided early on that there wasn't anything about my physiology that couldn't get up in the middle of the night and give a bottle. Uh, she had taken care of our children in nature's own way, but I certainly could do that. So I guess. This was early on in our ministry with the first little Joseph, and so it was about 2 or 2.30 or 3 in the morning. It was my shift. I had the baby. I was giving him the bottle, and he was about six or seven weeks old, just at the point where he was beginning to smile. And I was looking at him, and, you know, I'm a guy, so the way you give a bottle, it's all about a fulcrum. You put the head here, you put the body here, you got the bottle here, and it all works. And I had fed him and I'd burped him and I was looking at him and he started smiling at me and I just adored him. I mean, I fell just deeply and madly in love with that little baby boy and then I did the dumbest thing a human being can ever try to do. I tried to edit love. I tried not to feel love. I tried to talk myself out of love uh, and I said, no, you can't love him and you don't love him. You love the three upstairs asleep in their beds whose college education you're directly responsible for. You cannot love Rena baby. And then he smiled again. And I loved him. And as I loved him, it was as if trumpets blasted and bells rang and I understood in a way that I had never understood before what St. Paul was talking about because as I was loving that baby with an undiminished love, I was loving that baby with the same intensity that I had for my own children, my own natural children. I thought, my God, that's what St. Paul meant. That's what Abba is. There is absolutely no diminishment between the Father's love for Jesus in the Jordan River and God's love for each of us as we experience the water of our own baptism and we're baptized into that love bond. Nothing is diminished. So we are given that spirit of adoption which allows us to cry, Abba, Father. So the gift that that is then is the gift of love. We are literally loved to death. We are loved in a way that love is in no way diminished. God loves us like and to the same extent 
that God loves Jesus. We are, we are baptized into that love bond, into that family of love, and we are so confident in that that we cry, Abba, Father. So the second gift of our baptismal identity is love. The third gift is described in uh, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5 and verse 17. So if, any was, if anyone is in Christ, and by the way, in Christ is St. Paul's code language for our baptismal identity. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything, the old has passed away, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God trusts us to be extenders of God's reconciling love through Jesus Christ. You've heard, some of you have heard that have heard me preach. I frequently use the illustration from the year 2005 when the little Amish girls were, were killed in their school and, and it was time three or four days later for some Methodist ministry somewhere in Lancaster County, minister somewhere in Lancaster County, to bury the shooter. And, uh, and it was a very private burial, but yet the family looked up and there were Amish men walking towards the grave site because they knew their sister and her children were in a pain even more greater than theirs. And as those Christian Amish men walked into that graveyard, they were representing Jesus. They were ministers of reconciliation. God trusts us to extend the reconciling love that God has made visible in Jesus Christ. So when those baptized Amish men, out of their love for neighbor, walked into that cemetery, uh, cemetery, in a sense, Jesus walked into that cemetery because Jesus borrows our very bodies, claims our bodies in holy baptism, and unites our body with his body, unites us with his purpose, unites us with his ministry, unites us with his vocation, and then trusts us to extend reconciling love through the way we are in this world. So the third wonderful present, the third wonderful gift of our baptismal identity is purpose. We are extenders of Christ's reconciling, lo reconciling love. So then if I am a human being with a sense that I am loved to death, if I am a human being with a sense that I have all hope because I've been baptized into the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I have been baptized into Christ's great, or God's great defeating of death. That gives me hope. And if I know that I am trusted, trusted from the foundation of the world to be an extender of reconciling love, that gives me a sublime purpose. And I would say that a healthy person a whole person is a person who knows that they are possessed by love, hope, and purpose. So those are the three gifts of our identity. Now, looking at the Book of Common Prayer and the Baptismal Liturgy, I love beginning on page 298. This is the one place in the Book of Common Prayer where I think gospel is actually in a rubric. A rubric comes from... Uh, red writing in the missals of the Middle Ages, all of the directions that told the priest how to do the service were written in red. That's where we get the word rubric. The rubric at the top of page 298, I believe, is a gospel in about two and a half sentences. Holy baptism is full initiation by water and the Holy Spirit into Christ's body, the church. Affirmation number one. And then affirmation number two is incredible. The bond which God establishes in baptism is indissoluble. I love it. That's a watery kind of term. The bond that God establishes in holy baptism is indissoluble. 
it reminds me in some ways of that parable we discussed last week as we were trying to understand the, bat, the prayer book's concept of sin. The parable of the prodigal son, remember, the father was at a distance and saw and had compassion and ran and embraced and kissed. God cannot and will not. God is incapable of letting us go. God is incapable of losing us. God's love is hesed, steadfast, sticky, uh, and it cannot let us go. So that's, that rubric reminds the people gathered for baptism what our fundamental understanding is. Um, in the first book of Common Prayer and several books of Common Prayer after that, one of the most amazing things to realize, and remember the Book of Common Prayer came into being in 1549. In that book, there was no baptismal service for adults. Interestingly enough, in the midst of Christendom, there, the church had lost the capacity to imagine almost that adults would need to be baptized. And so uh, adult baptism came in to the prayer book in the 17th century in one sense because of a response to colonialism. We were finding new worlds where people had not heard the gospel, had not been baptized, and the prayer book had to accommodate that. So then we had a service of adult baptism. And then um, in the 60s and 70s, in the latter part, the the last third of the 20th century, we would begin to notice that um, Christendom, in a sense, was fading. And there were a lot of people, even in the 60s and 70s, we were noticing that a lot of our neighbors had not been baptized. And so, interestingly enough, the baptismal liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer which got its final approval in 1979, the prayer book assumes that when the body of Christ gathers for the sacrament of holy baptism, the candidate will be an adult. So this, our present prayer book liturgy is conceived on the notion that the candidate is an adult. And if children are being baptized, it is as an extension of our baptismal theology that assumes the normal recipient of holy baptism is a believing adult. And in, in, in some instances where the faith of the household, the faith of the family is so profound and so clear that we feel that it is appropriate to extend that adult norm to the children of believing adults, to the children of practicing adults, to the children of passionate Christians, then we do baptize uh, infants and children. However, the prayer book assumes the person being baptized first and foremost is an adult. If you go to page uh, 301, and that's where we begin after the church is gathered, presumably we've had a traditional Sunday morning uh, liturgy of word and the lectionary has been read, the priest has preached um, the gospel, and after the preaching of the gospel, which hopefully acknowledges that baptism is about to happen, uh, the celebrant says the candidate for holy baptism will now be presented. And baptized Christians will come forward and present their sister or their brother for the sacrament of holy baptism. Now, at this point, I want to remind you of what we have been talking about earlier. You know, we teased out the doctrine of creation on our first session. Then we talk, teased out the doctrine of what it means to be human in God's image. We have not lost any of that understanding. For example, what I'm saying is every adult, every child who comes for the waters of baptism is already and fundamentally a human being created in the image of God. They are already icons of the God who created us out of love and for love. So we are, we are baptizing people who bear God's image, but we're baptizing people who bear God's image and who have uh, a desire to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And so their desire leads them to the moment. I love the first question 
after the presentation. A baptized Christian says, I present Jane to be baptized for, to receive the sacrament of baptism. And the first thing the presider says is, do you desire to be baptized? As Holy Week is approaching, I'm reminded of one of my favorite phrases in what, what is the Passion narrative, where I believe it is in Luke's Gospel that Jesus says, I eagerly desire to eat this Passover with you. When a person stands at the font and the minister says, do you desire? What is really going on, I think, is a mingling of desires. Our desire for God and God's desire for us gets mingled in the moment of our baptism. So it's desire meeting desire. Do you desire to be baptized? The God who has desired a relationship with you uh, from the foundation of the world is about to receive an answering love from you, baptismal candidate, in your desiring. Desire meets desire. And because desire is meeting desire, and we are claiming our desire for God in Christ, it's going to require us to change. It's going to require us to be very aware of what, where this desire will lead. And part of that awareness, and I think it's so fascinating to notice, that before there are any yeses said in the baptismal liturgy, we have to say no. But it's a no that comes out of our desire to say a transformative yes. Do you renounce personified evil? Sometimes evil feels personified. It feels like a malevolent personal force. Sometimes evil feels more corporate. It's the evil I get caught up in because I'm part of a society that is adrift. And then the third way I experience evil and the third form of evil that I have to say no to before I can say the yes that I desire is to my own personal manifestation of evil. You know, as I said last week, we all have that same disease called sin, but each of us have different symptoms, different proclivities, different passions, different nudges that lead us astray. So I say no to personified evil, in Satan, I say no to the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy, and then I say no to the evil desires that draw me. So after I have said no, all desire requires us, all holy desire requires us to know how to say no. And after I've said no, and then I get to say yes. Do you turn to Jesus and accept him as your Savior? I do. Turning is from that word for repent, which is metanoia. I love the fact that metanoia rhymes with paranoia. We're turning from everything that makes us self-absorbed and self-obsessed and kind of paranoid to metanoia, that turning to God. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your savior? And then the next question is always slightly ambiguous to me because in one sense, you know, God loves us and fortunately God's desire is greater even than our desire. And so God will forgive us this, I think, but we'll say, do you uh, put your whole trust in his grace and love? Well, the truth is I have invested my trust all over the map. I, you know, I've invested my trust in my wife, in my friends, in my image, in my profession, uh, in my bank account. I mean, I'm always spreading that trust in the wrong place. But ultimately, ultimately in the middle of a pandemic, it gets very clear, I better had put my trust in God because everything else evaporates. Everything else evaporates. Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? I do. That's another part of my yes. And then, you know, here I am 
you know, if I'm doing baptisms in, at St. James Church, then I'm baptizing Americans. And we Americans fought a revolution, so we would never have a king, and we would never have a lord. And then suddenly, I take all of these American revolutionaries that are standing before me for baptism and ask them to accept the king again. Right. Isn't that odd? Do you promise to follow and obey him as your lord, as the defining reality out of which you make all choices, out of which you live your vocational life, out of which you live that purpose that we were talking about earlier that God trusts us with. And uh, then uh, we ask the church for words of support. Will you who witness these vows do all in your power to support this person in their life in Christ? That tells us a really important thing about what the Prayer Book Believes Church is. We are, community, we are a community of mutual support. We are always gathering to encourage each other in the living of our common baptismal identity. We must do it with support. We must support. We need support. And we are a community of support. And then we say the creed. We say the baptismal creed. The Apostles' Creed, the baptismal creed, is much older than the Nicene Creed. It is more simple. And the truth is, up the street at uh, the Presbyterian Church and over at the Methodist Church and at First Baptist, uh, and at even at the Baptist Church, you will find the Apostles' Creed and the hymnal at the Roman Catholic Church. This is what we Christians have in common, this baptismal creed. And in the early church, they would gather at an octagonal font. Most fonts, not St. James, interestingly enough, but most fonts are shaped in an octagon, eight-sided. That's because uh, our baptismal day is the eighth day of creation. And so in the ancient church, after they had prepared for a long time, the, the bishop would say, do you believe in God the Father? They would profess belief in God the Father, and then the deacons would immerse the candidate in the name of the Father. And then... They would come up dripping wet, and the bishop would say, do you believe in God the Son? And then they would make the professions about God the Son and be dipped in the name of the Son. And the third profession was about the Holy Spirit, and then they'd be dipped in the name of the Holy Spirit. Um, now we tend to do it all in one confession. We say that we believe in God who is revealed to us as Father, Son, and Spirit, and then we we get ready to be baptized into the name. We get ready to be baptized into the name. N-A-M-E, I baptize you in the name. That means I baptize you into the very inner life of God that we know as a community of love, as Holy Trinity. So the Holy Trinity wants to share their inner life with us. We're baptized into that name, and that will have implications. That will have implications for we live that, how we live, that trusted identity in the world. So the next five questions are all about how we're going to be disciples. Now, some of you who've been present at baptisms where I have presided, uh, you know that uh, I have a way of thinking about each of these questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, uh, will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? This is the one that is so exquisitely painful for us right now in this quarantine because we can't gather physically, but we're certainly finding ways of gathering spiritually that have been creative and, and very impactful from what I'm gathering from people. But the reason we gather, I use the analogy of grilling with a charcoal fire, and most people that have done that know what happens with the one or two briquettes that fall off the pile. They tend to go out. We need to come together as the body of Christ, whether virtually as we're doing now or in the more normative way of coming together, which is to actually be in proximity, because we need to rekindle faith from each other. Things can happen in life. Life happens. We get the pink slip. Uh, someone we have, we have loved all of our life is parted from us by death. Uh, we get a diagnosis, someone breaks our heart, and in those moments, that burning faith can burn more dimly, and we need to be rekindled by the faith of others, so we vow to come together for the breaking of bread and the prayers uh, and fellowship. The, the next disciple question that comes, because we know we share God's inner life and God's name, and, and we want to be faithful to the implications of that, the second question has to do with sin last week's uh, topic. 
will you persevere in resisting evil? And notice, I, I just think this is such a powerful word. And whenever you fall into sin, not if you fall into sin, but whenever you fall into sin, because we're always falling into sin, we human critters just can't help ourselves. Like I said last week, Oscar Wilde from the 19th century is, speaks a word of truth to all of us when he famously said, I can resist anything but temptation. Well, that's true. That's true for Oscar Wilde. That's true for Ted Gulick. And that's true for pretty much anybody I've ever met. So we don't lie to God. We don't make promises to God that are impossible. We're very realistic. Uh, and so we tell God that we're going to try real hard to resist evil. And in Christian community, that's always helping us re-identify ourselves. That's easier than it is alone. But when we screw up, when we mess up, when we fall short, when we go to the pig pen where we are alone and isolated, we don't despair. And whenever we fall, we get up and we go from paranoia to metanoia and we walk back to that love which is waiting and yearning and urgent for us. The third question I sometimes say to church, I actually sort of believe this. I, you know, sometimes I wonder whether the Episcopal Church has a stronger propensity for uh, introverts than some other branches of Christendom, but uh, I think this next valley is very frightening. It frightens me. I mean, I, it doesn't just frighten people I know, it frightens me. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Well, that is a post-Christendom question at its core, because you see, about half the people in the United States do not profess faith in Jesus Christ. They haven't been to Sunday school, they haven't been to church, they don't know the story. They haven't read Jesus stories in their Sunday school. They don't know the story. And the truth is, they may actually encounter the story first in your life, in your life and in my life. Is anything about the life I live, the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to Ted or to Elizabeth or to Jane or to Tom or to Sam? Are, are our lives gospel lives? Do people read Jesus in the way we live? Will you proclaim by word and example, will you be a gospel person is the question. And uh, I think even though when we first hear it, it might sound like the church is asking us to go around on a Saturday afternoon and hand out pamphlets uh, or something like that. I don't think that's the power of the vow. The power of the vow is we leave we live, we're called to live lives that are readable as gospel. And the last two have some powerful question, words in the questions. Really powerful words. Will you seek and serve? Will you strive? You seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself. Will you strive for justice and peace among all? A-L-L. -L, a word that has only three English letters, but it, is, but it is as wide as the stretched out, pinned down arms of Jesus on his hard wooden cross. That's how wide a concept it is. It includes everyone. So, uh, and you know what? Maybe as I'm speaking to you in the middle of quarantine, by the way, I found out that the word quarantine comes from the Latin for 40 days. So as I speak to you, from a real Lent, probably the, the most real Lent I've ever experienced from this quarantine, from this 40 days, I tell you that part of what we are pledging in our baptism is to uh, seek and serve Christ in all persons. And there's nothing like a coronavirus to realize that we are absolutely one humanity on this one earth and we have to learn that over and over again. And we have to live our baptism as if we believe that the arms of Christ embrace all. So, that's what we profess. That's what we say. Then we are buried with Christ in his death in the water of baptism. But before we do that, the church tells a story at the font. We thank you, God, for the gift of water. 
over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Here again, the Bible has a way of informing the prayer book. That comes from Genesis, separation of the waters and the land. Uh, then the next water story we tell as we're standing at the font full of water is the water story of God liberating his chosen people, Israel, from slavery in Egypt. The next water story we tell is the story of Jesus standing with all the other desperados in the Jordan River being baptized by John. Um, and so after telling those water stories, we thank God for the water of baptism. We rehearse our theology. We're buried with Christ in his death. We share in his resurrection, and we're reborn by the Holy Spirit. Um, therefore, in joyful obedience to your son, we bring into his fellowship, that's the word in Greek is koinonia, those who come to him in faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in the inner life. So, what does, the what does the prayer book believe about baptism? What is the prayer book? The fact is, the prayer book teaches me that as a baptized Christian, I am loved to death. I have a hope that is boundless. Even in the midst of a virus, I have hope. <laughs> and I have a purpose to be the hands and the heart, the feet and the mind of Christ, ministering, reconciling love in this world. Uh, so as a person made in God's image and as a person baptized into the event of Jesus Christ, I live in purpose and hope and love. That is my uh, identity as a Christian, and that is what my church teaches me about my baptism in the Book of Common Prayer. Thank you for listening and tuning in this week. One more session. See you next week, and what we're going to tease out next week is the church's understanding of nationhood. What does it mean to be a nation on this earth, uh, cognizant and aware of God's understanding of, of that? So that's next week's topic. And I hope to talk to you next week.